19th century was a time of turmoil that affected all the people of southern Africa. Settled communities were migrating and new settlers were pouring into the subcontinent. In Durban's outskirts, Inanda became a pleasant sanctuary, a safe and fertile ground for the seeds of righteousness and unity to take root and flourish. Inanda itself translated into a pleasant place in Zulu. Inanda is one of the important areas, uh, not just in the history of Deben, but in the history of South Africa and possibly of Africa. South Africa's iconic president paid tribute to this rich history when he chose to cast his vote at Inanda. What was so special and of such historical significance in this area, in this place called Inanda? The history of the place is very important because what you see today is not at all a reflection of what it was when I was growing up. It seemed that Inanda in the early 1900s lived up to its name of being a pleasant place. Around the turn of the century, several wealthier Christians from Inanda Mission bought land and settled in the area. Many ex indentured Indian agriculturalists also bought land and settled here. Most people made a living from growing crops. People lived peacefully and in harmony with each other. Many saw this as a divine place. Inanda was one of those areas that was called released area number 33. And released area meant that they hadn't declared that area to be for any particular race group. So you had like the Inanda Seminary, which was run by white people. Then you had the Hlangi Institute. Then you come to Kosi Nshembe, he had a community, he had a vision, and his community was driven by his religion. I'm a Kawama name, if I can put it that way. Come from Inanda. Uh, 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 it is home to uh, some of the greatest pioneers. Uh, who championed change at different fronts. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, John Langabale Dube, and Prophet Isa Shembe. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, born in India, his father was a chief minister and his mother was a devout Hindu. He came to South Africa in 1893 as a young lawyer and eventually settled in Inanda. By the time he left South Africa for his native India in 1914, at the age of 46, Gandhi's philosophy of Satyagraha was fully conceptualized. <laughs> Prophet Isaiah Mloiswa Mliwama Fashembe was born at Ndabam Hlope in the Drakensberg region of KwaZulu Natal. He claimed that the voice of God led him from Dabazwe Harry Smith to Inanda. Here, he became the founder of the Ibanda Lama Nazareta, the largest African initiated church during his lifetime. Reverend John Langalbalele Dube was born in Inanda in the mission station where his father, Reverend James Dube, was one of the first ordained African pastors. His parents were persuaded to send him to America to further his studies. He went and chose to come back to Inanda full of ideas and enthusiasm to take his community forward. It was really a, a, an accident of history that you end up having these giants um, being here in Ananda, you know, Gandhi coming. Dube comes from this community, but also because of it's his home, these are his roots and all that. The, the, the interesting phenomenon is with a Shembe who comes from, who really doesn't have any historical links and roots in this place. 
being led by the Spirit to come and preach in this community and stays and buys land and stays happy and it becomes his settlement. From a religious perspective, you can then say this became a chosen place. Um, uh, there was some level of a divine intervention to make it a special place for it to nurture uh, the leadership that was going to take uh, the country forward. And so, these three leaders all lived in Inanda. Reverend John Dube at the present Ohlange Institute, Mahatma Gandhi at the Phoenix Settlement, and Prophet Isaiah Shembe at Ebuhleni. All were within a close distance from each other, resembling a triangle on the map of Inanda, a triangle of faith. At the time, Inanda had a magical energy to it, reminiscent of its name. But is this something that endured until the present day? <laughs> Inanda became home to three great leaders, Reverend John Dube, Isaiah Shembe, and Mahatma Gandhi. All three set about mobilizing people and galvanizing them towards a better life. A striking feature of all these men was their strong religious fervor. What is most important to them was the religion. Gandhi embraced all the religion, yeah. all the official religion, he embraced it. And through religion, John Dube managed to rule the ANC, to be the first president of the ANC. And even Ushambe was using the religion to unite the Zulus. The common theme was that they saw religion as a tool that could be used for the struggle against any forms of oppression of their people. By 1910, the soil of Inanda was already nurturing the seeds of two great leaders. Dube and Gandhi were settled here and establishing strong communities. Something was to happen to bring Shembe to this pleasant place. Ushembe esuga entabazwe wailande la inkainiz ogu yonia ea imuhola imkombesu utigip la mafunakaya kona Uma Ushembe says in Tabin Kangas, Wafi Angulungulu, Exuk, a Wesa Yonke into it wing well, a Wesa March at wing well, Wesi Shash as it wing well, Wesa Chan between well. In Inanda, his arrival completed the triangle of faith and gave an opportunity for the three men to have this mystical place as a common base. So, for instance, Gandhi uh, came from the Hindu background. Uh, Dube came from the Christian background. But his, um, he, the way he approached Christianity was that it was from a mission-educated elite's perspective. Whereas uh, Ushembe, Isaiah Shembe himself, came into Christianity uh, coming from a very, very African traditional religion perspective. So they came from religious experiences as politicians, but they had some divergences here and there in their approaches. I think people recognize a lot of the First Testament in the Chembe movement. What was amazing is that within his lifetime, he had five million followers. If there's an order and a structure to the evolution of how you're gonna deal with oppression, the first might be that the, the, the faith response gives you an optimism and a hope, and it gives you a universality and, a, and a, um, an infinite history.
John Tube, he struggled and the funding, he outsourced it from the state. So John Tube, because his uh, philosophy, it was Triple H, so that the African people must be taught. Dubey's idea was shaped by Booker T. Washington's idea that you have to learn uh, skills, handwork skills, so that at the end of the day you become self-sufficient and not dependent on anyone. To use head, heart and hand in the name of God. People must be taught to be self-reliant, self-empowerment. You must use your hands. It, it zen zen. That's what he used to, to, to say. Do things for yourself. In fact, that's where his name, Umafuguzela, comes from. The one who was doing things with his hands. That's why John Dube founded this first African industrial school, which is called Ohlang Institute, in 1900. So John Dube is the one who sacrificed everything for us in order to live a better life. That was Dube's uh, idea, basically. And Mr. Shembe had similar ideas as well. He also told his people in his community that you have to learn as a result of which you find that a lot of the Shembe people long before other people in this country began beadwork. They were the uh, pioneers. Reverend John Dube and Desire Shembe both shared similar philosophies based on empowerment and self-reliance of living off the land. Perhaps they were influenced by Mahatma Gandhi and his experiments with sustainable living, his experiments with religion, the three pillars of his philosophy that he developed at Inanda. Everything started at Phoenix that make he, Mohandas Gandhi the Mahatma Gandhi because he spent 21 years in South Africa. So his trinity began in this place. His trinity is ahimsa, is a non-killing, satyagra is a call to action on the basis of truth. And lastly, the other trinity is sarvodaya, it means welfare for all. My mother uh, gave me a book called Gandhi Before India, so I was pleased to read that and then all of a sudden discovered that the entire book was about South Africa. Um, and I was much more familiar with the ANC side and the political movement and the struggle from that point of view. But I had no idea that South Africa was basically the home of Satyagraha. A friend of mine uh, referred me to John Dube and said, well, while you're down there, check out John Dube. And so I said, okay, I will. So one afternoon, I came to the Gandhi settlement, then went up the street to the Ochlang Institute and the Shembi uh, site was just extraordinary. Y you had to know that some of the incredible power and um, historical events that happened here happened because these communities were connecting to each other. And so, Dube, Gandhi and Shembe were all in Inanda at the same time. All worked for their communities and their organizations. All were deeply spiritual. Having these strong sentiments of righteousness and truth within them, all were propelled whilst in Inanda to take action towards the unjust laws in South Africa. Inanda is a freedom value route, reason why our heroes and heroines who were in the forefront in terms of our revolution towards democracy, it all started here. Because from within, especially from within this site, this is the site where early seeds of democracy were sown out. From within the institution or from within Inanda, it is a long walk to freedom. Yes, yeah. That's why Inanda heritage route is so very important. And we also talk about education. 
can they talk again? Can they talk about education, spirituality, nature care, and self sufficiency? All, all those four things are very important. Let make sure the good they are united. At a time of great injustices and oppression, Shembe, Gandhi and Dube all struggled for the emancipation of their communities. They may have shared some similar ideas, but also held some different approaches, although their goals remained the same. They were all religiously informed, but were politically involved too. The, the phenomenon that maybe uh, talks to all three of them is that all of them were fighting for liberation, but all of them were fighting on a perspective of peace. They were not at all violent people. They were advocating peace. Dube himself was fascinated by Gandhi's work uh, of motivating the Indians to resist oppression the police were beating them hard in the railway lines when they were on strike and they were not retreating. And Dubai even says, where do these people get this strength? He says, my people cannot resist this kind of brutality with peace. And he's conversing with Gandhi at that. And Gandhi says, this is how we, we fight uh, oppression and all that. So Dubai was very much touched by Gandhi's uh, accession and commitment to peace. Uh, secondly, when you look at, uh, at, um, at, at Gandhi himself, he admired uh, Dubé's work. There are uh, writings where you, you read a lot about the interaction between those two leaders. And it goes beyond when you look at uh, Shembe, again, very, very peaceful, humble man, concentrating on fighting the system, but in a very traditional, peaceful way. Ushembe, Waham San and Aban to as they were oppressed. Shembe was with them. He even taught them how to pray and prayed with them for them to be liberated. In spite of the fact that he's using, he's standing from a Zulu culture, which is a, a culture of warriors and all that, but he's very peaceful. There is no, 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 no evidence of him encouraging, encouraging violent resistance and involvement, not at all but a peaceful approach. And you see this being common to these three leaders. And you also pick the fact that Dube and uh, Shembe were, you may not necessarily say they were close friends, but they were friends because they interacted with one another. Could this interaction between these three legends have been the inspiration to Inanda's success during that time? Their common theme of having peaceful methods saw them looking for different ways to fight the system. How could they overcome this oppression? What would serve as a tool to mobilize the masses? Both uh, Gandhiji and Mr. Dubey felt that, you know, an important thing uh, in the work that they wanted to do was to be able to educate the community through a mouthpiece. So media was very, very important. John Dube, as he was also an educationalist, he saw that any nation cannot live without a newspaper. And particularly a media that will give 
authentic information to the community. They found that uh, these newspapers, newspapers on the very same year, in 1903, and they used to share resources between them. So there was more of a connection of which they were visionaries. The first issue of The Indian Opinion by Gandhi was released on the 6th of June, 1903. The first issue of Ilang La Senatal by John Dubey was also released that same year. Because Gandhi had a printing press, uh, he, he could able to air his views to the community using Indian opinion that was published in two four languages, Gujarati, Tamil, Hindi, as well as English. The Ilana of John Tube was almost a political journal that was journaling the, the deep experiences of the Zulu people in this, uh, in Deben, and also some insights about the country. But it was a tool of conscientizing people and documenting what black people were going through in those days. Those were uh, important ways of uh, liberating the human spirit through galvanizing and mobilizing and activating action, action uh, challenging people to, uh, to be bigger than themselves. It was a time of unrest and injustice towards many communities. While the three men were involved in building their organizations and supporting different groups of people through faith-based methods, the struggle against oppression took center stage and the newspapers became a main focus. So basically, uh, Gandhiji explained, and I think uh, Ilangalasi Natal was along the same lines, that the purposes of a newspaper are firstly to educate the community, and through that to mobilize the community. So the media was an instrument to achieve these three purposes. Ilanga then began to conscientize the Zulu people and then those who were reading it about the need to stand up for their own liberation. There is a link between these three leaders that both of them, Utube and Nukand, they had printing press. And Ushambe was directed by the Word of God. So that he started Umuzi was a paramen. Why Buni Songa Kulu Shep? Ipsuk Figala, go twelve one o'clock Ipsuk is to come be. When a ham big head of Wagumu to a so tips you when you sister this is yes what good here a band back a shame a lab back to the to the gangani thing about you seen the pillars a lion a humbling in ya is well a the printing press at Gandhi's settlement proved invaluable as both Gandhi and Dubé used it for their newspapers. Dubé's newspaper was able to speak through many voices, including that of Isaiah Shembe and his many visions. It is a privilege uh, that as a nation, we can go back to the archives of Ilana and begin to read what was happening, read what Dube was writing, what Dube was struggling with, and what his contemporaries 
were writing and saying about him. And also even about Shembe. It's written about Shembe. It's, you've got material about Gandhi in Ilang. I think the, the thing that struck me with, Dembe, with um, Dubé and Gandhi is that they both went out of the country about the same period and were exposed to some of the um, responses to the struggle that we were going through in the United States. Um, and, and they both came back to South Africa about the same uh, period of time. And they both bring a message of uh, self-reliance and um, a response, uh, an intellectual response as well as a creative response um, that we're going to create. So Dubé focused on education, literal education, and Gandhi sort of focused on spiritual education and bringing some of his Indian um, heritage to a very modern struggle at that point. Dubé, he w it seems as though he was less committed to a political response as he was committed to education and self-upliftment. Um, and so a lot of what he wrote and a lot of the messages that he wrote were less about a specific political response and more about a, sort of a human response and how we need to pull together as tribes, as organizations, as people, as cultures to respond to this thing. Isaiah Hashem is the real, you know, the, the founder of the uh, Shembe uh, religion. He was a very political as well. He was very much, uh, for instance, he and Mr. Dubé used to talk about because, uh, you know, they were kind of uh, fighting against the tax that the people had, so for their people. He was political. Hymns were political. Shembe hymns are political, yeah. But in a different way. He was fighting the system, yes, because he knows the pain. He, feel the, he felt the pain. South Africa Vuga Zokele is Kuni Zako. The Sunday Rezonke is Izwe. The water um Lilo Wako. South Africa Vuga Uchehova Uchiko Wako. Agunig Elako Iziko. A sequencing is Serelo, Guena Africa, Uchehova Gupela, Wisban Sako, Gipelel and Getem. Shembe's hymns were already being printed in Dube's Ilanga newspaper. At that time, Mahatma Gandhi's Natal Indian Congress, which was formed in 1894, was seeing some favorable outcomes against the oppressors. South African history was about to take a turn with Dube in the forefront, a turn which would eventually see freedom realized in the country. In 1912, under its founding president, Reverend John Dube, the South African Native National Congress was formed. It later became the African National Congress. The aim was to bring together the people who were experiencing oppression to understand that the liberation can only happen if they congregate and come together to face the enemy that they were facing. The problem is that in those days, none of these things could be publicized. None of these things could be openly said because there was so much of repression. The minute that African people in particular began talking politics, they would be, uh, you know, yeah. As we know that during that era, there was strict laws of which we, as the majority of this country, were suppressed in many ways. So they were the one who mark the history towards freedom. The first democratically elected president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, made the journey back to Inanda, to the area of the founder of the African National Congress when he finally got his chance to cast his vote. After he had cast his vote, he visited John Dube's grave and said, Mr. President, I have come to report to you that South Africa is now free. The reason why Nelson Mandela decided to come and cast his first democratic vote, he in Wazunatale, Deben, Enanda, 
Othlangans should cause he wanted to honor the life and time of the founder and first president of ANC, Dr. John Langan Bailetu. Because John Dube, he was born on the 11th February, and also he passed away on the 11th February. Dr. Nelson Mandela also, he was released in prison on the 11th February, 1990. Just 25 kilometers northeast of Durban was once home to three phenomenal men, Dube, Shembe, and Gandhi. Three men who helped shape KwaZulu Natal. Three men who paved the path for freedom for South Africa. It seemed that the collective energy and the strong bond between them was a catalyst for action, for growth, and eventually for liberation. My father was a friend of his. He used to visit here. And they used to visit each other. Mahatma, Shembe, and the friends, at least. There was a lot of that kind of friendship interaction between Phoenix Settlement, the Dubé Settlement, and the Shembe Settlement. And growing up, I know we used to always interact with them. So yes, uh, clearly they were uh, individual pioneers uh, who were in constant communication. And Shembe knows Gandhi, yes, because when Shembe arrived at Upagamen, he had no place to stay. It was the Indian community who offered a place for him to set up Muzwa Sipamen. So most of Amanaza Reta, the old, the old Indian community, the role that they played when Shemba was looking for the place to stay. of Indian people who followed the religion. There were people who actually were part of the Shembe movement. They used to do, they were baptized, they used to follow all the rituals of the Shembe. Even during the July festival, Indian community, they used to come there to visit Babu Shembe. So there's a great link. They used to have a lot of people coming and staying there and then they didn't have enough water and so on. So they used to come to Phoenix and uh, take water from the well that uh, my grandfather had uh, you know, sunk. So we, sh we used to share resources. Jail to Ube, we were going to go to the house and we were going to the house and the prophet. Even though we were going to go to the house and we were going to go to the house, it all starts here. Inanda is a freedom value route. Reason why our heroes and heroines who were in a forefront in terms of our revolution towards democracy. This is the site where any city of democracy was sewn out. From within the institution or from within Inanda, it is a long walk to freedom, yes, yeah. Because when I talk about all these prominent leaders who were in a forefront in terms of our uh, revolution towards democracy, they were born and raised here in Nantes. So there is a, our history lies here.
Today, Inanda is still looked upon as a heritage site that offers inspiration to the people of South Africa and abroad. The three great men, Dube, Shembe and Gandhi, who lived in Inanda during the early 1900s, strived to create a harmonious and peaceful sanctuary. The harmony was short-lived though. The respect and understanding seemed to seep through the cracks of instigated doubt and hostility. Sadly, the Inanda that they worked so hard to build was torn apart by the apartheid government. All of their efforts at peaceful resolutions, all of their efforts to keep their communities in harmony seemed to be in vain during the tragic time of apartheid. It was a system that has created hatred because you are much better, you can able to think, you can able to survive. That hatred was created. violence all of them that's what you read about these great leaders peace peace and those basic principles of working for of solving problems through peaceful means that's not the way those leaders led the struggle. We need to learn that from them. Instead of fighting and burning and destroying things that are out there. I think in Yipuni Gakul, good Timanji, succeed in the law of my party. For instance, Dube, actually Dube didn't need to come back to South Africa with his American education. You remember that he was educated in America. Sacrifice, come back home to serve his people. In one of the books uh, that I, I have written, there's a quotation that say, where Dube says, I will always struggle for my people. The values of sacrifice and righteousness seem to be at the forefront of the minds of leaders such as Gandhi, Dube and Shembe. Perhaps they did not realize it as they busied themselves with the fight for freedom and immersed their hearts into their spiritual journey. But their inspirational methods and love for the people was greatly admired then and still is in present times. three strong leaders who emerged in Inanda, Dube, Shembe and Gandhi. They were known to be leaders who were able to serve and leaders who were seekers of truth.
But when they had the chance, the opportunity to meet and share ideologies, philosophies and resources to form a bond of possible friendship, did this impact on the area they live in? In every age, history has a tendency to throw up relevant leaders. Every era has got its own relevant leaders who just come up, being produced by the dynamics, the socio-economic, cultural, religious dynamics of the time. A beautiful exhibition, his house has been rebuilt. If people, they, are, they normally come there for spirituality, they do meditations, and uh, they just walk around, they get healed because they believe that his spirit is back at Phoenix Settlement. The mortal frames of John Dube, Mahatma Gandhi and Isaiah Shembe might have long ago perished. Their vision for a united and truly South African Inanda may have been ravaged by apartheid, but their moral legacy continues to inspire and to rebuild Inanda to present day. The Inanda heritage route a route almost dedicated to the three leaders has become one that attracts many visitors every year. Winding its way through the Yenanda Valley, it provides the stories of these men as one is able to experience the space occupied by them. The trail starts in Phoenix Settlement with Gandhi's house and his international printing press and museum. Next, it moves on to Orlange Institute, Dube's house, a national monument, and his grave. Also on the trail is Inanda Seminary, the first secondary school for African girls. And finally, the route stops at Ebleni with a look at the elaborate rituals at the Shembe Church. All of these individuals were facing the same struggle and facing the same repression. Um, but we know from those movements that um, because it's, multi, it's a multifaceted struggle, and so each of us find different, pers different personalities, find different problems with the struggle and want to solve it and respond to it in different ways. And here in Ananda, you had the birth of three primary major forces for how we could respond to the struggle that they were facing at that time. So the community, they nicknamed him Mafuguzela, like the sky. The sky is working non-stop for all of us without getting rest, and he was a selfless leader. You know, they led by example. When people were, were struggling, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, there is no doubt, he was in the front. It's, it's not this kind of idea that leaders say, I lead, I lead from behind, or I lead from alongside. What is that? Here we've got leaders who led from the front. You know, Shembe, people followed Shembe, leading them to independence, to healing, to freedom, to an Afro a perspective, to Christianity, to Intlangagazi and all that. In the front, leading them and all that. You saw Gandhi leading the struggle, him himself personally being kicked out of a train being persecuted and all that, leading his people to freedom, in the front, leading. Dube himself faced even being arrested because he was leading from the front. And you can understand the humanity in each other. Um, and I think that message resonated very, very quickly because it wasn't about black or white and it wasn't about this organization against the, versus that organization. It was a universal movement of faith. do everything we need to put God first. So he was putting God first. That's why they started this uh, Chloras movement. But the fact that they all were lifted up along this, you know, 25 kilometer stretch of road and that they all came around at the same time. Uh, 
as Gandhi said, we need to fight against nepotism, corruption, greediness. We need to fight against those evil things because they destroy our lives. That's the kind of leadership that is needed. People who are going to show good leadership to people and people can work alongside them and support them in that good work. Those are the, some of the insights that one pick up from these leaders. And we dare not forget that so as we live, uh, as we work, uh, as we administer, as we lead, uh, we must always remember that the foundations that have been laid by pioneers such as John Dube, Mahatma Gandhi, Prophet Isaiah Shemba, and of course Mandela and many others. The world is perceived to be both beautiful and mysterious. Beautiful because of the certain coincidences that take place. Mysterious because when these coincidences bear fruit or become somewhat magical, we question the very nature of it being a coincidence. In South Africa, in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, in a place called Inanda, there once was a time of beauty. Three men, strong leaders, all shared the same space during the same time. John Dube, Isaiah Shembe, and Mahatma Gandhi. Three leaders who shared and learned together to make a difference in their triangle of faith. 